and because I'm an international client, so much of my work had been on Zoom. So Zoom was not a new platform for me. I'd been on Zoom, I'd been working on Zoom. So it was an easy shift. Uh, however, our in-person events had to shift. So we now have a new program that we launched and it's called Your Story Now. And it's all about what is the most important story to be sharing with your ideal audience in this moment. And in this moment isn't ever evolving in this moment. And at the intersection of a global pandemic, uh, the comeuppance of structural and institutional racism in this country, uh, a mental health pandemic that nobody's talking about, you know, an election that is like bringing high anxiety levels to everybody <laughs> in this country, you know, uh, you have to speak to the moment. Otherwise, people were like, what planet are you on? And I could see there were some people that I, that I, that I saw that were like, you know, it felt like they were sharing stories or branding images that, that felt, you know, very 2019. And mm -hmm. it was like, that doesn't make any sense. I don't know where you are. Like, I don't want to be consuming that. Mm -hmm. but it felt uh, weird. It felt like, a, like a, again, as someone who, uh, who sings and, and performs and has been in choruses and singing groups, it felt like, wait a second, it's like an atonal, like, wow, that's, that's weird. Uh, so, um, so this new program is, is all about how we can serve, uh, entrepreneurs, you know, uh, nonprofit leaders, people who have pivoted and shift and have a new story to tell. How do I find that new story and what's the call to action that I want for my ideal audience? So, um, that's, a, that's a virtual program. It is gender inclusive. It, you know, in the, in the past, our group programs have only been for women. So this mm -hmm. is a gender inclusive offering. You know, when I do work one-on-one -on -one with clients, I do work with, with all gender expressions. Um, and this was something that we also saw as an opportunity to, uh, to really create a more inclusive space for our entrepreneurs and, uh, and thought leaders. And, and we had, you know, people across the gender spectrum who wanted support in, in, in landing on concise, effective language to share who they are and what they're up to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so that's a new program that we have. And that's something that we're now going to offer forever. You know, so that, that, that feels like a really great offering in concert with our live in-person events when we're able to, to offer those again. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing, I, I don't advertise that I do this, but one of the, and this is also, you know, responding to the need that emerges in the moment. There's a whole part of my business that is, uh, that is MBA interview prep. Mm. So I don't advertise it, but I have clients of mine that run an MBA consulting company. It's called Menlo Coaching. And they, they wanted support on their public speaking. I worked with them on that. They were like, this is really cool. We don't work with people on delivery. That's something that I feel like you do in a way that's really powerful. So we work on mindset and also delivery. And we, we've been incorporated into their process during, uh, during times of recession and uncertainty. People go back to school. So that was a part of my business that also wasn't impacted. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I had diverse revenue streams also served me, right? So that was also something that was instinctual and also trusting what was emerging in the moment that created that. So I did have revenue that was coming in during the COVID and that's, and that's actually something that picked up. So we've now expanded our interview prep work into, uh, you know, undergraduate admissions, medical school admissions, law school admissions, uh, also in New York City, there's middle school and elementary school and high school admissions, right? So there's a whole right. ecosystem around that. And I'm not looking to, to become an application coach and coach you on that, but there is a specific way we can work with you around the interview prep. And again, the mindset and the delivery piece that can be a yes and to people who are already in that space. So what we've done is we've created partnerships with different companies that do that support. And that's also now something that's expanded. Mm -hmm. So, um, so those are ways in which we've been, we've innovated in the moment, listened and, and sought uh, to, again, support people and be of service in ways that really uh, are relevant to the moment. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you work with your clients around the idea of fear. Beautiful. Uh, so I always go back to second grade and show and tell and with Mrs. Fox's 
uh, class. I love Mrs. Fox. And I had this little stuffed animal seal that I call Sammy the seal. And I love Sammy. Uh, and I stood in front of my classmates and I said, seals are mammals. They live in the water. They eat fish. Sometimes they're eaten by sharks. I mean, I crushed it. It was the Tony <laughs> Award of second grade regional mm -hmm. uh, non-New York City, <laughs> you know, <laughs> elementary school show and tells. And after I finished, the teacher said, are you done? And I was like, no, I have more to share. And then I said, and I named him after someone in this class. And then I said, I named him after Brett MacGyver. And Brett MacGyver was the blonde popular boy that I had a crush on in second grade in Miami, Florida in 1986, and it didn't go well. Mm. And in that moment, standing in front of my classmates, I decided three things. When I stand in front of people to speak, I can't be myself. I can't speak the truth. And if I do, it's dangerous. And I am now 43 years old, and that fear is always present. My biggest fear when I stand up in front of people to speak is they're going to think that I'm gay. Mm -hmm. Because that is the root shame that I have in my life. Now, I have been out since I was 18. And if you're guessing that I'm gay, I am. Yes! <laughs> However, there is this fear that I carry with me, this original trauma that has me fear that I actually can't show up, that I have to, and it's, you know, 18 years of oppressive performance of macro and micro aggressing the pitch of my voice and how I pronounce my S and, you know, uh, not sounding too feminine or not being too girly or, you know, someone calling me a sissy or, you know, there are all these ways in which my brain was formed to protect myself right. from that. And it is a moment by moment permission that I have to give myself to surrender that and actually show up empowered in service of other people. And my audience is not gonna do that for me. I have to do that myself. So the word is not fear gone or fear done or fear without. The word is fear less. So it's not about giving up the fear, but it's about powerfully being related to the fear so I can show up in service of the people who I'm committed to make a difference for. Mm. And the process that we have is, uh, it's, there are four phases to the work. Um, and this is what I call our story doula process. And I say we begin grounded in body, present in mind. We lead from the heart and we speak into the spirit of our shared humanity. And I believe that all our work begins with the body. Mm -hmm. There's a fabulous saying from an indigenous community in Papua New Guinea, which is knowledge is only rumor until it lives in the muscle. Mm -hmm. There's so much knowledge that we have in our muscle and our, in, in, our, in, in every fiber of our muscle. And there is a part of us that is not connected to it. Right. And this is the public speaking is taught as an intellectual exercise, but not a physical, spiritual and emotional exercise. So we want to get connected to our body. That's what people don't have access to. For the most part, we're not taught that. So we're kind of talking heads, but our bodies are kind of flailing, you know, because we don't know what's going on down there. And that's what the acting, the theater work does. Your body is your tool. Your voice is the instrument, right? Your body is the instrument. So getting really related to that. So we really begin with the body. Mm -hmm. And then we move into the mindset and really distilling what is that original shame? We all have it. The statistic is that 76% of people suffer from speech anxiety, and I believe everybody else lies. <laughs> so if you're not feeling anything, you're not a person, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so the feeling something is fine. Now we have different relationships around the feeling of it. Some people can feel it as fear. Some people can feel it as excitement. It's still the same feeling. Right, and how do we build a relationship to that? Understand how is that feeling something that I can use as fuel in my communication? And then how can I craft content that is heart-centered, that is all about connecting with people? It's an exercise, speaking is an exercise of connection, not an exercise in perfection. And then how do I get out of the way? How do I get out of the way so that really all that I'm focused on is my audience and making a difference for them. And the word, I, I, I'm not religious, so I don't, I don't espouse any type of religious faith. Uh, and the word spirit has the same root word from the word to inspire or to aspire or to expire, which means to breathe. 
When we inspire, we breathe in. When we expire, we breathe out. When we aspire, we attain with breath. And when we speak, we breathe. Like our exhale is writing our voice, our communication. So when we speak, we share spirit. So when we communicate, we have the power to move your spirit because then you're propelled in action in a way that you wouldn't have been before. Now you're speaking the story that I shared with you. Now you're communicating. Now, now my spirit is living in your spirit as you are sharing. The names of the people, the, pe the stories that I shared, they now live in you as you share them with your audience, right? So that's the scaling of our storytelling. That as you go on and you share what you learned from me, you are now sharing my spirit mm -hmm. with other people. And that is the power of verbal communication. Mm -hmm. And that is the, and that is how we approach our work in the various ways that we support our clients. Okay. Wonderful. So with everything that you have done and experienced so far, what would you say has been the best advice that you ever received? Mm you know, I love that you said, trust your gut and what emerges in the moment. Mm -hmm. What emerged from me was fail forward. Mm. And, um, and I think that in the entrepreneurial journey, I think sometimes we can be plagued by perfectionism. And there's something very, and, and I think that we also academically come from a culture where, you know, failing is bad, mm -hmm. you know, and what that has us do is, is stop trying, right? Because we're actually afraid of failing. And, you know, I remember, uh, you know, one of my early speeches that I gave was around um, go big or go home, that phrase. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, let's just go big. We're all going home anyway. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> like at the end of the day, I'm going to go home, whether I win or I lose. It's not like, you know, it's not. So I just say go big. And I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity to learn in the, in the risking greatly. Hmm. And, and I think that it, it, it and, and failing sucks, you know, mm -hmm. falling on your face is horrible. Making a mistake blows, you know, it's like, it's not cute. <laughs> However, it, it is, it is how we learn and it is how we expand. And I think learning how to fail forward with grace is, is a huge opportunity. And, and, the, and, and there, there, there are two things that I want to share with that. One, there's a very uh, famous uh, Teddy Roosevelt quote. It's called In the Arena. And I don't know if you've heard it. Uh, Brene Brown does an unbelievable sharing of it in her Netflix special. And, and, she, and she talks, what, 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 what Teddy Roosevelt talks about, it's not the critic who counts, but it counts to actually be in the arena doing the work, mm. right? And I think there's something very powerful about being in the arena and trying it out, right? It's very easy to be in the stands and to be critical and say, oh, I would have, or they should have. And it's very different to be on the court, in the arena, in the field, on the stage, doing the best that you can. So that's really powerful. And the second, you know, I, I want to share with you a little song that I learned at my kindergarten graduation. Mm -hmm. And it's called Everyone Makes Mistakes. And it goes like this. Everyone makes mistakes. So yes, they do. Your sister and your brother and your mother, father too. Big people, small people, matter of fact, all people. Everyone makes mistakes, so why can't you? If everyone in the whole wide world makes mistakes, then why can't you? So that's my little gift. Everyone makes mistakes, fail forward. You do you, boo-boo. At the end of the day, just be a person. Own up when you make a mistake and keep marching forward. Thank you so much, Eduardo. This was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I love it. And I got a song. That's, you got uh, a tune. Exactly. You got a, you got a little tune. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is wonderful. I've only, I've only had one other person sing on this show. So this is, uh, I love it. Maybe I should try to find more people who, <laughs> who, who will spontaneously burst into song because it makes it more exciting. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
So again, thank you so much, Eduardo, for taking the time to chat with me. I really appreciate it.